Hey, my name is Pete Morrison and welcome to another VBS Technology Conference. I'm just going to share some slides here. Uh, I'm the Chief Commercial Officer of Bohemia Interactive Simulations. I'm in charge of a number of things, including the long-term product roadmap. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the projects that are shaping uh, our short-term future, the, the short-term future of VBS. Uh, I'm going to present for about 40 minutes, and then Earl is going to join us to give um, one of the best VBS4 terrain demonstrations that I've ever seen. Uh, so this system is called Demio. On the right, uh, you should see a chat box. You can type questions there, and those questions will be shared directly with our moderators, and we'll try and get to your questions at the end. Uh, so this is a two-day event. Today, I'm talking about the, the short-term future. Tomorrow, uh, we're talking about VBS4 21.1, which uh, has just been released, and we're very excited about that, uh, obviously. Okay, so here's the agenda for today. Um, I'm going to be presenting a bit about BI Sim, just a refresher for those who don't know you, don't know us, sorry. Um, I'll be talking about our products, uh, VBS4, talking about the projects and development efforts that are shaping VBS4. I'm going to give you an idea of our high level focus areas for the next two years. And then we'll wrap up with that terrain demonstration that I mentioned uh, mentioned earlier. We've got an hour's worth of content here, uh, and we'll hang around for as long as required to answer any questions that you might have. So first off, uh, who are we? Um, we are a software developer focused on the military and military adjacent markets. Our flagship product, VBS3, is used in over 60 countries now, uh, trains thousands of military personnel. Uh, and we've recently launched VBS4, Blue IG, and the World Server. Our products are funded both by our investors, but also customer funding. Uh, and we have been able to capture all of the improvements and changes from the last 15 years and kind of bring them along with us as we release new versions of VBS. We are over 300 strong now. We've been hiring fairly rapidly due to winning some uh, additional contracts, especially in the US. Uh, and the majority of our company is software engineers. Uh, and we've faithfully served NATO and NATO ally allies for over 20 years. Uh, VBS is used in over 60 countries, uh, and here are our products as, um, as of now. We sell VBS4, which is a, a virtual desktop trainer. It is an application designed to train soldiers, sailors, and airmen and women. Uh, they play this game, a training game, from the first person perspective, typically in a big battle simulation center, one soldier per computer, uh, and they practice cognitive learning. You know, a game like VBS doesn't really teach a soldier how to use a rifle. It helps teach them how to think. And that's where game-based training has proven to be very, very effective. Uh, so that's VBS4. And then we have VBS Blue IG, which is our image generator product. It's designed to be deployed on simulators, tank, helicopter, planes, that type of thing, uh, and leveraged by integrators. And then we have the VBS World Server, which streams terrain layers, whole earth terrain layers, out to VBS4 and VBS Blue IG. Uh, and the world server is included for free with both VBS4 and Blue IG. So we have a bunch of new VBS4 capability that I'll be talking about today and tomorrow. Uh, we have our supporting SDKs, software development kits and APIs, and of course, Terra Tools, um, which Earl will also be speaking about later in the brief. So VBS4 is an easy to use whole earth virtual and constructive simulation. It is uh, a big step up from VBS3. You know, VBS3 I referred to as a virtual sim designed to be primarily human in the loop. With VBS4, we've increased the entity count dramatically. Uh, we've increased the fidelity of the artificial intelligence. And now we have customers that are using it as a constructive simulation uh, in its own right. And we're working on a number of initiatives to, even, uh, to, 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 to push that even further forward. And I'll be talking about that later in the brief. Comparing VBS3 to VBS4, uh, we're seeing a huge amount of additional capability and ease of use enhancements in VBS4. It's very much uh, a different product, although we've tried to retain some uh, common interfaces or user interface elements so you don't have to retrain your administrators. So, so VBS4 is easier to use. We've got this new VBS Geo uh, Terrain Editor, the VBS Plan Mission Planning Tool, uh, and really, really quickly, 35 times faster um, if you're making a, a company level scenario, uh, 10, 10 times faster for terrain editing. You can generally build scenario content more quickly in VBS4 than you could in VBS3. We have a much higher entity count. 
Uh, VBS4 typically runs at 60 frames per second or more. We support additional use cases, and of course, we include the VBS World Server. Uh, now, VBS4 does support the import of VBS3 terrains. They come as, in as a terrain inset on the VBS uh, base globe, as well as import of VBS3 scenarios. So there is also some measure of backwards compatibility there from VBS3 to VBS4. Now, VBS4 has been very much re-architected. VBS3 was monolithic, meaning that the game engine and the simulation engine were kind of tightly intertwined. We've spent the last couple of years kind of breaking that apart. We built a new game engine called VBS Blue, which is a terrain rendering and a terrain ingestion engine. We've connected that to the VBS simulation engine through low-level low APIs. We have our content, obviously, over 19,000 individual pieces of uh, 3D content our world server, and then we have our user interfaces for uh, delivering training, ultimately. So VBS4 is an application. It's much more than a game engine, and it's very modular compared to its predecessor, VBS3. So VBS4 provides high fidelity rendering from space down to blades of grass and ocean floor. It offers unlimited view distances with exceptional detail at the ground level, and you're going to see how we've continued to improve that. We include a baseline global terrain representation that's continuously being improved. Uh, and uh, I'll talk to that. And we blend, for example, um, different data sources together or conflate different data sources. You'll see, for example, uh, me doing that with Microsoft Bing data during one of the presentations today. You can train anywhere on Earth. You right click anywhere on Earth, Africa, Asia, wherever you might need to, uh, create a battle space, and you can start training immediately. And then there are these tools like VBS Geo for quickly adding uh, changes to the terrain if that's what you need without uh, terrain experts being required. So here's the VBS4 workflow. Uh, the idea is that you plan in your mission command information systems, you prepare your scenario in VBS4 using VBS plan, VBS editor, and VBS geo. You execute in virtual simulation or constructive simulation or both. Uh, you can also use VBS4 as an instructor operating station using the real-time editor. And of course, then we have a, a very thorough, high-fidelity after-action review so you can assess soldier performance in VBS4. And VBS4 is very much an all-in-one application. Everything you need to conduct training from end to end is included with the product. VBS4 supports many, many different training use cases. And uh, one of the unique things I think about VBS4 is that as we are funded to implement a new training use case, back in, for example, VBS2, we make sure that that same training use case still works in VBS4 today. And, and over time, this has had a snowball effect. Uh, we support hundreds of training use cases now. Uh, and quite uniquely, they kind of work together. So the small boat simulation for anti-piracy operations that the Marine Corps funded back in 2012, that works with the vehicle checkpoint work, escalation of force simulation that we did for the US Army in 2008. You can do many of these different training use cases at the same time in the same battle space. And that's, that's really quite unique. So what's shaping VBS? Well, uh, VBS has always been funded through a combination of both uh, internal investment, R&D, uh, as well as customer projects. And uh, we've never been busier than we are now. <laughs> the business is growing really rapidly, uh, but it's really exciting because we've got a lot of funding uh, pushing these products forward in directions that I think all of our customers will find very interesting. Uh, we were recently awarded um, a subcontract for TSS TMT, working with Team SESI to deliver significant components of the US Army TSS TMT, so part, which is part of the US Army synthetic training environment. Uh, and this is just one example project, but it's definitely an important one. Uh, VBS4 is being integrated within TSS TMT as RBCT Soldier is what it's known as there. Uh, our world server technology sits between US Army One World Terrain and the various simulation runtimes that comprise TSS TMT. And VBS Blue IG is being, uh, well, already has been integrated on the RBCT A and RBCT G, which are reconfigurable virtual collective trainers. Uh, so we're working on this where we're, we're, um, a number of teams actually already engaged. There's a full press release at bisimulations.com if you'd like to read more into the detail. 
I have uh, a couple of photos here. These were posted publicly by the US Army uh, on various LinkedIn channels showing the soldier touch point that just occurred a couple of weeks ago. Uh, these soldiers are using a VBS-4 here, or RBCT soldier as it's known within TSS TMT, to conduct squad level training. And the soldier touch points will continue over the next few years. Uh, each soldier touch point kind of gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, and uh, it's quite an exciting uh, project to be part of. One of the things that surprised me about this project were most of the soldiers preferred to use a gamepad, an Xbox controller, as opposed to keyboard and mouse. Uh, and that's just one example of the way that TSS TMT is shaping VBS4. One of the things we're doing uh, is an in-game user experience overhaul. Now, the in-game experience within VBS hasn't really changed in, in, a, in, a, in a long time uh, because, uh, you know, to be honest with you, it, it worked and, and soldiers were trained in using it and we didn't feel the need to make huge changes in-game from VBS version to VBS version. But what we see now is kind of a new type of soldier coming through, a soldier who is extremely familiar with computer games, maybe playing uh, PC games or Xbox games or PlayStation games. And we realized that we're going to need to create this alternative mode uh, that you can use if you wish. It's not going to be mandatory, but it'd be there if you want to use it, which sort of modernizes the in-game experience. So some examples here on the screen, extending gamepad support to in-game UIs like the inventory or interact with vehicles, replacing the action menu. If you've played VBS, the action menu is that uh, the little box on the bottom right and you use the mouse uh, to kind of scroll through the options there. We're going to replace that with a radial menu. Um, you know, Star Citizen, for example, is providing some inspiration there. We're improving urban operations and the way that uh, animations work when soldiers are clearing tight spaces, indoor spaces. Uh, we're improving the way that grenades are thrown indoors to make them more accurate. We're going to, going to be supporting in-game weapon customization. So that's extending the current uh, universal component system so soldiers can attach a silencer, attach a new type of scope in-game. And we're also doing an, uh, an ease of use rework on VBS Editor. So I have a, a video here just to show you what some of the uh, initial work looks like. So um, what you're about to see here is the reworked inventory. So this is all prototype, but actually this reworked inventory was used at Soldier Touchpoint 1A recently. Um, it looks different, so it's themed differently, but most importantly, you can actually do a lot more with it. So you can see that we have equip and reload buttons uh, directly within this interface. We can change weapon modes. And the idea is to reduce the number of keystrokes that users need to remember. Uh, so we kind of want to limit that down. Right now, there's like 100 keystrokes. We want to kind of get that down to under 10. Uh, so here we're using the uh, the new inventory to change weapon mode. We just went to our grenade launcher. We can reload the weapon. We can equip a different weapon. So here we're equipping our sidearm. Equipping grenades and changing also the different type of grenade that is equipped. So now we have our smoke uh, grenade equipped here. And we're, we're making little tweaks as well just to make it easier to use. So for example, the ability to select a weapon. So we can click here and now we can see uh, the type of rounds that are usable that are highlighted within the inventory itself. So just some examples of how, how we're improving the inventory. Uh, this type of work will continue for the next um, year or two, I would say. But you'll start to see improvements in 22.1 coming out in January. So here's the second improvement. Now this is an editor improvement. Uh, this one was heavily requested. It's called Global Overrides. And what it allows an administrator to do is set unlimited ammunition, unlimited fuel, uh, or set no damage for entire uh, groups of units or individual units. So you can see here that we can set these global overrides uh, for different types of groups of, of units. Uh, by way of example here, what I'm going to do is set unlimited ammunition for the players, and I'm going to set no damage for blue four. And we'll have a look at the corresponding effect in game. Now, this works at real time as well. So it works both offline and online. Um, so this guy just tried to shoot me. Um, he couldn't kill me because I'm invulnerable. And I also have unlimited ammunition. So what happens, the way that works is if I use the last round in my last magazine, I get given another magazine. So soldiers still need to reload. It just means they get another free magazine. Uh, and this saves a lot of kind of painful scripting for administrators who, who want to um, set up this type of uh, this type of feature within their in their scenario. Because sometimes it's annoying to run out of ammunition. It might detract from the training. Um, so this allows you to fix that. What you see on screen here is just setting overrides now on an individual unit basis. 
So here I'm going to um, set the, the op four to have unlimited ammo and the blue four to take no damage. And you can probably imagine what's going to happen. This guy is going to keep shooting at me, but I'm not taking any damage and this would continue. But And he's got unlimited ammunition. You can see he's still reloading his magazine, um, but he always has unlimited magazines. So hopefully that's all uh, well explained. So I think now we're going to move to the next example here. Right, now this one is more accurate grenade throwing. So uh, we realized that grenades when thrown indoors were not accurate. They weren't following the grenade throw line perfectly. And also the grenade throw line was attached to the soldier's hand. So it moved around all over the place. So we've now fixed that. So you can see that you can throw grenades really accurately. They follow the line and they explode where they're supposed to. Now this grenade throw, throw line, you can still turn that off if you want to turn it off. Um, but yeah, we felt we needed to make this type of fix. And this is just one of many examples to improve the in-game user experience. Um, but we really haven't changed the physics of grenades very much. So if we throw a smoke grenade, for example, here uh, up at this corner of the roof, you'll still see that bounce realistically off and land and, and there's our smoke grenade. And just two more quick improvements to show you. So this one is, is pretty simple, but important. And this is the ability to change weapons using one, two, three, and four keys on the keyboard, uh, which is a typical way in modern first person shooters that you change weapons. So pressing one, uh, will go to primary weapon or change weapon mode. Pressing two will take you to your sidearm. Pressing three will take you to your launcher and pressing four will take you through your throw and put weapons, grenades and claymores. Um, and certainly much easier than pressing spacebar 10 times, you know, to select your grenades. Um, so a very simple but important change. And now, now really the big one is the removal of the action menu. So this is the first prototype of VBS with no action menu in the bottom right. It's been replaced by the quick menu, but what you're looking at, you can still interact with by pressing a key, for example, the F key. So here I'm looking at the back of this vehicle. I pressed F to open the doors. Uh, I, you know, I'm looking at the door, I can close it. And this quick menu is being extended to replace the action menu. Uh, this is a radial menu. It's compatible with Xbox controllers. It's very similar in function to Star Citizen. Um, we're still, you know, re-theming it and such, but the functionality is, is, is pretty much there. We're now going to get into this vehicle and it's context aware. So now we're sitting in this, in this vehicle, we can access vehicle systems, we can turn, turn the engine on, we can get out. Um, these used to be in the action menu. Now they've been moved here. We can access our inventory. We can also access our communications channels. So yeah, so less remembering keyboard keystrokes and making things accessible quickly and easily through this menu in a way that's also working with a gamepad controller. And now the last example is just running through a building here, having a look at how quick and easy it is now uh, without the action menu and just simply pressing F to select what we're looking at. We're going to open the door, press F to open that door. We're going to run in here. We need to open uh, the mouse hole, press F to open the mouse hole, press F to open the hatch. Um, important, but really kind of, you know, simplistic, I guess, changes that will, will make training just quicker and easier within VBS. Okay, so we're now moving on to VBS Blue engine improvements. And just a reminder, I'm talking about uh, improvements that are coming in the near future here. So let's talk about DLSS first off. We have implemented, well, I should say by way of introduction, that VBS Blue is the game engine that underpins both VBS4 and Blue IG. Um, we built it from the ground up for very good reasons. It's WGS84 um, compliant. It's really built for military specific use cases. And it's looking fantastic as you'll see through these different demonstrations. Now DLSS is a technology from NVIDIA, which in essence allows us to uh, render high resolution scenes at much faster frame rates, but it requires a NVIDIA graphics card. Um, and as you can see here at full HD resolution, we're getting a 170% um, increase in frame rate. Uh, and even greater performance up to 200% increase at uh, in 4K. So yeah, really important improvement, much faster frame rates, which we can all agree are important. Uh, okay, so um, I'm gonna show the next four in a video. I wanna talk quickly about Vulkan. So Vulkan is a new graphics library, very much cutting edge 
we're implementing support for that. That'll give us some, some nice new uh, graphical rendering features in the near future. And we're also working on a JRM sensor plugin. Now, VBS4 and BlueIG has a sensor rep representation. It's a plugin system that works very well. We see demand from customers to support JRM, and we're working on that with JRM. And we're going to make a separate announcement about that in a few months. I was actually just speaking to the JRM folks this morning, and that's proceeding very, very well. So let's now have a quick look at a video that kind of runs through some of the uh, some of the improvements. So first off, uh, 3D grass. So at the moment in VBS4, we have 2D grass, it's billboards. It kind of rotates as you look at it. The 3D grass that you see on screen will really fix that problem. Uh, we are building out grass for all of our biomes. We have over 50 of them, um, really to fix the kind of problem you're seeing here. You see this rotating billboard effect of the grass. That's not cool. I think we can all agree that that's not cool. And uh, this is the three. The three D grass looks obviously much better at uh, at all angles, uh, and we go into crazy detail. So you can see here that we really simulate every leaf um, because we can, and we're building out many different types of grass at this type of detail. Uh, we have precipitation and build up of puddles as a result of precipitation. This is actually already in VBS four. We really do care about that ultra high fidelity uh, at the ground level. We do uh, partial snow cover. We do both wet and dry snow. And of course, we support different seasons within the engine as well. So this is winter with snow. This is obviously summer. Um, you know, the trees have changed color and, and, and so on. We are working on a, a really nice implementation of volumetric clouds. Clouds will kind of gather and move in a realistic way. Um, we're hoping to get this out early next year. Um, as you can see from these shots, it's quite realistic. We'll have different types of clouds. We'll have multiple cloud layers. Um, this is um, this was shot by a developer, uh, just kind of ripping the camera through the clouds here. And as you can see, it looks really quite realistic. The system is also very configurable. Um, so you can see a debug window here. We are intending to connect this to uh, real world weather services as well. And this is what it looks like with sort of maximum cloud cover uh, above the clouds. So yeah, really quite happy. This is work in progress, but as you can see, it's coming along uh, quite nicely. Now this was a, a video shot by a developer um, on, a, on a developer PC. So the performance is not good, but uh, I decided to show it. Uh, he didn't really know that I was gonna be showing it like this, but uh, you can see multi-lane roads. So these are completely procedural. Uh, we'll be supporting these from OpenStreetMap data. Um, we can support multiple lanes, different lane markings, uh, different sidewalks, as you're about to see. I'm just gonna let this video run. Uh, and it's completely procedural. So the roads cut their way uh, through hillsides, they cut through forests. Um, everything just updates um, really, really quickly in, in the engine. So here we've just uh, added, um, we changed the lane markings. We have a three lane road here, two lanes one way. You know, we have a five lane road, uh, two lanes and three lanes. You're changing the texture here of uh, the road itself. And finally, just adding um, pavement or, or walkways down the side of the roads as well. And finally, we've been working on our extruded building tech. So we're making sure now that there are no artifacts. We support physically based rendering. Um, windows are rendered in a more realistic way. We have more variation in our extruded buildings. All of the, everything you see on screen has just been extruded from OpenStreetMap. We also support a more realistic night scene. Um, so lights in windows, completely procedural depending on time of day. So you have less, win less lights in windows at two o'clock in the morning. This is just an Asian theme, um, extruded buildings, again, a completely different regional theme. Uh, and finally, the last scene here is just showing some of the improved atmospheric rendering that we have in VBS, uh, in, in VBS4, in the latest VBS Blue engine. So that's the VBS Blue engine. Uh, let's move on now, quickly talk about particle effects. I'm not gonna spend long on this. Uh, VBS4 currently has the same particle effect system, particle effects of smoke and um, things from explosion, dust, and rocks and stuff. Um, so yeah, what you can see on screen is us reworking that. Again, this is kind of work in progress, but just a more realistic and more efficient um, rendering of particle effects from weapon fire events. Uh, that was a missile launching. Uh, and we're still working on this, but we're, we're really aiming to also increase the realism of, of you know, shells exploding on the ground. Uh, and that's what you can, you can see here. Of course, in VBS4, we also support uh, dynamic destruction of the terrain and defam defamation of the terrain. So particle effects are coming along. Um, that's fairly self-explanatory. 
All right, close air support improvements. So we're really getting into some of the, the, the new and exciting stuff here now. And um, we're about halfway through this development. We have a couple of months still to go, um, but I, I wanted to show everybody because I'm really excited about this. I'm excited about everything, but especially excited about this. So the idea is that within VBS plan, an instructor or administrator can uh, create a close air support mission based upon feedback or a nine line from uh, the trainee kind of, you know, in the field uh, virtually. So we have this uh, nine line request concept. We have spline based deterministic aircraft flight models, which is completely new. We support no fire and no fly zones. We have event reporting and uh, also after action re uh, review support. Let's get straight into the video. Um, I shot this video myself a few days ago. Now what you're seeing here, we're, we're in an OP in Kabul. I've done no terrain development. I've just connected to Microsoft Bing. I'm pulling in Microsoft Bing 2D data. It's conflating with the VBS4 base globe automatically. Zero terrain development. What you're seeing here is VBS4 21.1. Okay, so we have uh, two A10s and an Apache in support. Uh, I'm playing the part of this forward observer or JTAC here, and I've identified that we have a mechanized infantry platoon to our front. Uh, we'll laze and we see that we're just over three kilometers range um, from these vehicles. And we're going to call in a close air support now to take care of this. I think we just have a couple more scenes uh, showing you where we are. Yep. So I actually used VBS Geo within VBS4 to create my little OP here. It took me less than a minute uh, to place down this little bunker and, and make sure it just can fit on the hillside there perfectly. So now in VBS plan, this is where the magic happens. So we're going to use this new close air support module. The first thing we're going to do is make sure that the A10s and the Apache is correctly routed. So we're putting the A10s into a wheel orbit around CP1 and we'll tell the Apache to hover at CP2. And you can see these spline based um, flight paths that I spoke about getting automatically created. Uh, so these aircraft will move at realistic speeds uh, at the set altitudes and uh, they'll move with quite high fidelity. So if we have a look here at our A-10, you can see our A-10 flying over Kabul here about to enter its orbit uh, and it's banking and updating it at, at high frame rates, uh, just like any other VBS asset. And you can shoot these down, you know, these are, these are VBS vehicles in their own right. They just have a new type of deterministic AI um, that's driving them around. So now we're going to create a no-fly zone. We do that directly in VBS plan. We clicked on the no, no fly zone icon and we've just drawn this polygon. And that of course gives us a no fly zone visible in both 2D and 3D. And now we're actually going to uh, call in the close air support strike. So um, we're going to do this while we're looking at the enemy accessing VBS plan here, selecting the A-10, and then running through the process to, to create the mission. So we're gonna go with one aircraft, we're going to go through IP-1, we're going to place a target, we're gonna place the target directly on the BMP, select target one, we're gonna egress to the south, and we're gonna select a big bomb to drop on this BMP. And we'll clear hot to make sure the engagement actually happens. Now, what that's done is automatically create this flight path. And you can see that on screen. So the A-10 is going to move from its orbit. It's going to go through IP-1 and then drop a bomb. But it's moving through the no-fly zone. And we can fix that by changing the position of the spline at runtime. So that's what you just saw us do here. So we can actually um, have precise control over where the aircraft will fly, uh, which is really important for this type of training. So the A-10 now is going to move in and it's going to drop a bomb. Uh, I'm going to accelerate time a little bit here just to get us over the target as quickly as possible. Time acceleration back to one times now. We've just crossed IP-1 and we're going to release the bomb. It's very, very hard to see uh, with this low resolution video here, but uh, we'll have a look at the ground and we're about to see a BMP get blown up. Okay, so now by just, uh, yeah, we can actually have a look now. We can see that dead BMP here from our, from our position. And just by way of example, we're going to do the same thing, but with the Apache, just have a look at a different type of um, 
flight path that gets created. Now we're still working on the Apache. Uh, we haven't finished the Hellfire model yet. Um, we, we, we have a model of a Hellfire, but but not in this in this context. Um, so the, the, you'll see the flight path here for the Apache. And because it's a helicopter, it obviously moves a lot slower. Uh, the flight path can be different. And again, we'll just accelerate time here. And as I mentioned earlier, these aircraft are normal VBS assets. So here we are, we can actually see that aircraft. If we had any aircraft equipment, we could shoot that aircraft down. Uh, it, it, it perfectly meshes into a normal VBS battle space. And like I said, we're still working on the Hellfire simulation, so we're not going to see a weapon fly out uh, just here. Uh, but you can imagine what that might look like. And um, just as the camera zooms out, I want to remind everybody that this, I did no terrain development whatsoever. What you're seeing on here, the regionally specific 3D vegetation, the extruded buildings, uh, the satellite data from Bing, all were just kind of in the baseline VBS4. So, um, and, and just as we zoom the camera out, I'd also point out the fact that we have just a much more kind of epic scale in VBS4. You know, we have uh, real world view distances. We can take the camera all the way out into orbit. And I don't have time now, but I actually pan the camera out into orbit. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's, a, it's much more flexible than VBS3 for this type of use. Okay, so that's uh, close air support improvements. Now we're going to uh, change gear again and have a look at another project. So this one is Ground Logistics Autonomous Movement, GLAM. Now this is a VBS3 customer funded project, but everything that you're going to see here will be ported into VBS4. Uh, and what this does is give a huge number of different capabilities related to autonomous vehicles. Uh, and mm -hmm. There's a bunch of text here, but I think what we'll do is just jump straight into the video just to show off um, what this looks like in game. And again, you're gonna be looking at VBS3 here. So it's actually interesting to compare the graphics from VBS3 to VBS4, but, but keep that in mind, everything you're seeing will go to VBS4. So here we have various autonomous vehicles that were created for this project. This one carries a stretcher, for example. Some of them have weapon systems. Um, just a quick example for a, a stretcher carry here, we're gonna carry this body, increase time acceleration, and obviously, we can just put the body onto uh, one of the stretches here. So these are fully functional autonomous vehicles. And then we can attach these autonomous vehicles to in-game player-controlled entities. So now the player is controlling all of these entities uh, through their simulated um, handheld device or emulated handheld device. So we've just told these autonomous vehicles to follow the player. So you can see they're faithfully following the player around, all these little robots. And there are different ways we can control them. We can give them waypoints. So for example, here we're telling them to head over there and hold fire. So they'll just kind of move in formation towards, the, uh, towards that location, tell them to stop. And we also support pre-configured waypoints as well. So here they're gonna to move to UGV West and then UGV East. Uh, so you can pre-configure waypoints that you then wanna use within the scenario. And it supports both this kind of off-road artificial intelligence as well as uh, convoy AI. So here's an autonomous convoy. It's moving extremely quickly, um, but we're giving a waypoint here to a convoy um, made up entirely of autonomous vehicles. Now, it's also possible to drive the vehicles manually, so kind of a remote control capability with different cameras that you can use. So for example, a wide field of view camera here, as well as other kind of camera support. So here we're gonna use the cameras to back right up to a tree without running into this tree. Now we've implemented a bunch of new logistics vehicles, built British logistics vehicles for this. But what's interesting for all of our VBS customers is that the autopilot capability that we built for this works on any vehicle. Uh, it'll become clear what I mean by that, but basically you can now have autonomous vehicles in a convoy driving by themselves with no artificial or human controlled um, you know, person driving the vehicle, right? And these specific vehicles have these little lights on the front of the vehicle to indicate whether or not the autopilot is actually driving them. Um, so this is uh, this light capability, I believe, is specific to the British vehicles. But we can give this vehicle a, a waypoint here, 
and uh, the autopilot is turned on. So we'll actually see a light. This light turns red to indicate that the autopilot is driving that vehicle. And the light will again change color when we tell that vehicle to, to stop. We've deactivated the autopilot. So here's an example of a human controlled character giving control and taking control away from the vehicle's autopilot. So we're about to deactivate the autopilot. The human is now in control, driving the vehicle and then reactivating the autopilot again. And what this means is that you can have a single human operator hand control over to the autopilot and like jump on the main gun, right? So uh, it allows a lot of really interesting experimentation with autopilots. Um, here we're telling the autopilot obviously to halt, we can change the max speed, change the spacing and so on. And again, this, this capability is available with every VBS uh, vehicle once this is implemented in the baseline. Our convoy artificial intelligence has been upgraded. So we actually have a new prefer road settings. Uh, there's prefer roads, which means that the vehicles will go off road if it's the only way for them to get to their objective. So here, for example, this convoy is going to go around this obstacle, uh, which previously they wouldn't have done. And then finally, we have the commander machine interface capability, so CMI. Uh, and you can set this up for specific positions within a vehicle and you link the CMI editor object to the vehicle. And what that gives you, as you'll see in just a couple of seconds, is a lot of information about all of the vehicles that are in a convoy, uh, autonomous or otherwise. You can see where they're heading, you can see uh, how much damage they've taken. So this is just kind of useful information for a convoy commander uh, and it works with any, uh, any type of, of, of VBS4 vehicle. And there was one other really minor change. Uh, we're almost at the end of this video. We've added that in the top right, you can see the situational awareness monitor for armored vehicles, which shows the direction of vehicle turrets. Um, so that's also available now. It can be turned on, I think, on a per simulation setting basis. Okay, so that was GLAM. Um, lots of really uh, kind of interesting work we've done there. Uh, and I just want to point out the, uh, the huge amount of thinking that goes into this type of project. And uh, these were diagrams created by um, Will Day, one of our um, technical support specialists, uh, really thinking about these real world systems that we need to emulate within VBS, as well as the architecture and, and, and what type of computers are going to be involved in delivering this training. Um, so I don't want to go into detail, I, and there are actually many pictures like this. I just wanted to give people an appreciation of the thinking that goes into uh, designing a system like what you see with autonomous vehicles. Okay, so I'll talk about the next two years, and then I'm going to hand over to Earl, who is going to give um, an amazing VBS4 terrain demonstration. So look, Within Behem Interactive, and I'm the guy in charge of the long-term roadmap, so I feel a bit bad, um, I don't have like an accurate five-year roadmap. I, I certainly have aspirations for where we'd like to take VBS over the next two to five years. But the fact is that in addition to our own internal investment, our customers take VBS where they want to take it. And it's always been that way. Um, so I've tried here to give you a good idea of what you will see in the next two years. This is not an all-inclusive list, um, but it will give you a flavor of what we're working on. So I've already spoken about customer-funded improvements, um, UK, US Army, US Marine Corps, and many more funding uh, these types of improvements. Uh, you'll see uh, a bit of more information about terrain in Earl's brief, but we are really interested in making 3D data work within VBS. So 3D data uh, is really... Uh, I guess the next generation of terrain data. It's uh, you know, 3D data from Microsoft Bing. It's the well-formed format out of One World Terrain. It's 3D data from Lux Carta. It's 3D data that collect you collect yourself using a drone and, and photogrammetry. And uh, one of the big problems that we are solving right now is conflating that that 3D data with procedural data to give a really nice looking effect at ground level. Um, so photogrammetry is fantastic at 500 feet. At ground, it kind of looks like melted wax and we're working on fixing that. We're always increasing the fidelity of the VBS4 base globe data. You, know, you saw me talking about uh, the, some of the VBS blue engine improvements, the ground detail improvements, the new extruded buildings. Um, we do support bridges and overpasses as well. And you're going to be seeing that additional detail uh, in VBS4 um, in the near future. 
when we do the next uh, global build out. And you can imagine that takes quite a while, um, but uh, that's an important thing that we do on a regular basis. Web-based VBS world server management interface uh, that is allowing you to manage your world server data layers directly through a HTML interface, um, as well as kind of start, start and stop that service. Physics and animation are self-explanatory. We, we just upgraded our physics to PhysX 4.0. Uh, I'll be talking about that tomorrow. We also moved our physics into a separate component because VBS 4 is very modular, which will enable um, easier upgrades in the future. We're always supporting the latest XR headsets. We just implemented support for the latest JVC augmented reality headset. Uh, and it's, it's pretty cool. Um, so yeah, if you would like us to support a different type of headset, um, reach out. Typically anything that works with Steam VR already works with VBS. We're finalizing VBS plan. Uh, we are still intending to build an Orbat editor and improve some of the features like line of sight tool. Uh, at the moment, if you want a new Orbat, you really do need to kind of contact us and we can tell you how to do it. It's configured in, uh, in JSON files, um, but uh, yeah, we want to make that as easy as possible. So I don't know, the South Africans can build a South African Orbat or something like this. We're building out many more VBS control behaviors. The behaviors you just saw in the autonomous vehicle work, those were kind of all new as well as some extensions to some existing behaviors. It is our ambition to replace all legacy VBS behaviors with VBS control behaviors over the next two years. Um, we're doing continual optimization and hardening. For the first time, we actually published a known issues list with VBS 4 21.1, and we're working through that list. Uh, and um, our teams, our maintenance teams are, are getting bigger, our QA teams are getting bigger, uh, and we continue to uh, Im improve the, the reliability of the software. Cloudification of the VBS simulation engine. Now, this one is an interesting one. Uh, I can't go into a lot of detail, unfortunately, but what it will mean in the near future is larger scale in terms of entity count. So we currently support about 2,000 entities. You know, that's going to be, to be increasing in order of magnitude through this work, uh, as well as more flexibility. So more ways to deploy headless VBS simulation servers. Uh, so yeah, you're going to hear more about this, uh, I guess, in the coming months. We are working on this, and uh, it's it's really very exciting. Uh, and of course, improvement of VBS Blue IG. I have sort of neglected Blue IG in this presentation, but when we release a new version of VBS four, at the same time we release a new version of Blue IG. Um, so all of those VBS Blue improvements you saw go into the latest Blue IG, uh, and we have a roadmap for that. But it's really a separate presentation if you are interested. Okay, so that's the end of me talking. So Earl, um, if you could come on, please, I'll give you a quick introduction. All right, hey, welcome Earl. So Earl is technical director at Terrasim, and he's gonna take it from here to show you what's possible um, today with uh, VBS4 and the world server. Over to you, Earl. Okay, uh, thanks, Pete. So um, yeah, I'm gonna be taking- No, you're all good. Oh, sorry, good. <laughs> no, no, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'll be taking you through um, a demonstration of uh, a small area of terrain in Africa. And uh, first, I'm going to start by giving you some context for, for how we built this terrain. It's a little different than what we've uh, been doing in the past. Um, so just for the agenda here, we're going to look at the current uh, BISM terrain products. And we're going to talk a little bit about the BISM uh, world server technology. Um, we'll look specifically at the um, BISM World Server and LuxCarta Bright Earth uh, integration that we've done. So that's the kind of use case that we're, we're showing off today. Um, and then we'll give you a bit of background on the area that we've built out and jump into a terrain demonstration inside BBS4. Uh, so first to start, just kind of a recap here. Um, obviously, Pete's been talking about BBS4. Um, it's listed here as a sort of a my list of terrain products because it has two subcomponents or two two um, items with with it uh, that are relevant. So first, in these bullet points here, um, VBS Geo is an editing mode that's inside VBS4, and when you purchase VBS4, you get a license to the VBS World Server, which is a, a separate installer. So that's these next two items here: VBS Geo being the uh, kind of easy to use uh, terrain editing mode for uh, non-technical users. It lets you uh, adjust the positions of roads, add in forests, kind of with a paintbrush type approach. Uh, very easy to use. You don't need uh, specific uh, GIS training or anything like that to, to use it. Um, I'm not going to be diving into that today. There's actually a second segment uh, tomorrow where, where we'll be looking and uh, taking a, a deeper look at Geo <clears throat> at the end of the um, VBS4 demos in tomorrow's day two sessions. 
Um, so the VBS World Server, uh, this is uh, like a centralized terrain streaming server that connects to VBS4 and to VBS Blue IG and can stream terrain data to them. Um, and again, these three things are all part of uh, kind of the VBS4 uh, purchase. And as I mentioned, it works with uh, VBS Blue IG as well. Uh, and then separately, as a, as a separate purchase, there is TerraTools. That's uh, TerraSim's product. And it's um, uh, kind of an all-in-one uh, terrain generation tool for virtual terrain, not only VBS4, but uh, actually a, a wide range of other simulation formats, uh, over a dozen different uh, formats that we support um, for uh, simulation formats, and then uh, many more GIS formats. So collecting GIS data, bringing it together in TerraTools, building out a terrain, uh, and then ex exporting that terrain for as many different formats as you need, in including VBS4. So that's kind of the, the starting point. These are all released products that uh, many people are using right now. Uh, but what we're going to be looking at today is um, kind of focusing on what we can do, what, what else we can do with our world server technology. So we're looking at it as a framework, uh, and this, this set of um, COTS tools or commercial off-the-shelf tools that we've just uh, described. Um, and we're finding some new ways to kind of link these all together with the server technology to do interesting things that we weren't easily able to do previously. Um, and re really, the focus here is uh, autom automation and simplifying the terrain generation process. Um, and just to kind of explain the relationship here between uh, world server technology as a whole and the VBS world server. So the VBS world server is a product that we built. It's kind of a use case for our world server technology. The world server technology itself can potentially do very uh, much more. So um, we've been developing, developing that over the past few years, both uh, with internal investment, as Pete mentioned, and also uh, working with the US Army uh, on the One World Terrain program and, and related, uh, related development. So um, what we're actually looking at today is, an, is a test integration, sort of a, a prototype example of other things that we could do with this technology that starts to um, kind of open up the possibilities for, for automated terrain building. Um, so this diagram is an example of this uh, test case that we built or this kind of prototype integration. Um, I'll start by just kind of introducing the idea of Lux Carta's Bright Earth server quickly. So Lux Carta is, I think historically, is a telecom, is, is a company that provides uh, terrain data for telecom purposes. Um, they've uh, been working on a lot more uh, uh, ways of producing data recently, and we found that some of the stuff that they produce is, is really relevant to uh, simulation terrain. Uh, and so we wanted to basically run this experiment to see if we could uh, automate the server-to-server -server interaction uh, and make use of the data that they're generating. So if we go on the, on the far left here and look in these orange boxes, um, this represents kind of the user inputs. So what a user would do here in this case is use just a regular web browser <clears throat> and connect to the web server that's on our BISIM world server. So you're just using a browser. You connect to our server. You'll see a, a view of the planet. Uh, you can zoom in and then select the area that you want to have built. And what's going to happen is we will automatically send that request over to Lux Carta's Bright Earth server. They're going to start generating some data for us that uh, doesn't exist. We're not just downloading data, but we're actually um, receiving data that they're generating on demand for us. And that's things like uh, building footprints being automatically extracted from imagery, uh, areas of you know tree positions, <clears throat> excuse me, as well as some other uh, data layers that they have uh, pre-processed already. So it's a combination of downloading existing data and producing data on the fly. Now that package of data then comes back to us automatically to the server. Um, it gets sent off from uh, that sort of collection point to a TerraTools graph that's waiting. So no one's there using TerraTools. It's just uh, pre-configured to automatically run. And then that's going to flow down to the um, VBS Blue data pipeline when it's ready. And it's going to get automatically published on the server. And a VBS4 client that's connected is going to simply uh, see that terrain appear. So. That's a complicated way of saying uh, you use a web browser, you say go, and eventually a terrain appears in VBS4. Um, so the area that we're going to be looking at is the town of uh, Palma in Mozambique. So uh, earlier this year was the, the site of an attack by uh, Islamic State uh, uh, forces. And uh, it's also uh, nearby, there's a major natural gas development. And so there's been uh, considerable changes to the terrain. Um, and we're going to take a look at that here in a second. So there's a lot of new roads that have been built, uh, 
a huge number of new buildings. Uh, there's an entire airfield that didn't exist uh, as even just uh, at the end of 2020. Uh, and then all of the associated land cover changes for you know, areas of deforestation and that, those sorts of changes. Um, and if you look into some of the common mapping data sources that we tend to go to, open street maps and, and sources like that, it just doesn't have uh, a very up-to-date um, representation of the area. So that's where this type of process can become very interesting. And as I mentioned, the data in this demo is actually provided by LuxCarta. Um, I guess I'll just add as well that that's, this is just a sample integration. We're actually connecting to them using um, OGC or Open Geospatial standard connections. So the idea is this type of technology can be relatively easily connected to different data sources, say a national data set that you may have access to, or even uh, running this um, <clears throat> uh, you know, within your own server environment or network environment uh, off the internet. Okay, so just to take a look at the area here, this is um, this is uh, Palma in the north at the cent uh, top center of the image here. Uh, and this sort of triangular peninsula is the area of um, industrial development. So this is 2018 and you can see there's, well, you see there's not much there. As we go through, you'll see how much uh, it has changed in the, just the past few, few years. Um, so going through 2019, 2020, uh, and then the latest imagery in 2021, which is a few months old, uh, you can see the, an airfield has been built. Uh, there's a bunch of large cleared areas. Uh, there's the beginning of a port. Um, and so just significant development that uh, would make it hard to generate a terrain that's accurate to this type of area without uh, automated extraction, uh, just because our typical data sources don't hold all this info for us. OK, so now I will jump into the demonstration. I'll just get this going here. OK, so this should be running now. And uh, what you're looking at is just a Chrome browser. I'm going to connect to the web server on our, on our world server. And we will see a view of the Earth in a second here. Uh, then we're going to zoom into our area of interest. Uh, and you can see, hopefully, recognize the same town of Palma there. And then this triangular area is the uh, natural gas development. Um, we're just going to build a small piece of terrain in this example, uh, just for time's sake, and we'll talk about the timing and stuff in a minute. Um, this is a very early um, kind of prototype for us. We don't have all of our interface built. So um, I'm going to be using basically the area on screen becomes the request. And we can go down and select uh, this pre-configured LuxCarta process. And when I hit confirm, it's going to fire off that entire automated process that we just talked about. Now, we don't have a progress bar yet. So what I'm going to actually do once that goes is just show you kind of the internals quickly here, uh, just to show the kinds of things that it's doing. So we're going layer by layer, um, accessing sort of ortho imagery, clutter data, uh, elevation, you know, all these different layers of terrain data are being kind of requested and received back from the Bright Earth server stored on our side. Uh, and when that's all ready, we're going to kick off that Terra Tools process that has been pre-configured and, and is just waiting for data. So here it comes back. We have a preview of the data that was sent. In the background, it's actually running in Terra Tools. But what I can do now is just kind of show you uh, the data just for a kind of inspection. So you can see in white are all the buildings. And then uh, the green areas are the vegetation. Excuse me. OK, so and then the other thing you should notice here is the um, there's actually the uh, source imagery in the background. So um, we have our own base map that's actually outdated. And this imagery that the extraction was done from is actually much newer. And you can see pretty significant development has happened uh, even in the town. Uh, so again, working from the most recent data certainly helps us uh, generate a, a useful and, and representational terrain for the location. All right, so we're going to jump now into VBS4. Uh, and here, of course, you can see the, the base terrain we've been talking about. So there's a representation of the whole globe in BBS4. Um, but we're going to zoom into our little area of uh, terrain that we've just generated. Uh, and you can see it here. As we get in a little bit closer, you'll start to see the details. We have high resolution imagery. There's a high resolution, uh, what we call a surface map or land cover data that was extracted from the imagery. That's uh, being used to position all of the uh, areas of vegetation. 
and we'll just come in and take a close look at that. Uh, so again, you know, Pete talked about this. The um, this part of Africa is pre-configured to have a certain type of vegetation in VBS4. I didn't have to do anything except say, you know, an area should be a forest, uh, and it takes care of kind of filling in the detail. Uh, and as you've noticed there, of course, we have a building for every one of the footprints provided. We've generated a building. We've automatically and randomly assigned appropriate types of textures and, and surfaces for those. Um, and then we've also added in uh, a road. And along the road, we've automatically or procedurally just generated um, some uh, uh, utility poles and some lights. Um, so now what I'm actually going to do, so this was kind of the live kind of generation portion. Um, what I'm going to do is unload this data. And I can do that just by going to the server and actually removing some files. Uh, much easier than VBS3. In VBS4, we actually have kind of a live data concept for the terrain server. Uh, and what we're going to do now is actually load in the full area that we built for this, this test. And it's um, you know, rather than a, uh, just a number of minutes or however long that, that took to uh, just show that small tile, we're going to bring in um, uh, roughly a 30 by 30 kilometer area that took about two hours or three hours to build. Uh, and we're going to do this layer by layer. So when it was published by the server, of course, all the layers came in together. Uh, in this case, just to kind of walk you through it, we're going to bring in uh, each layer separately. So this first layer I'm bringing in is actually the um, surface map, uh, as we call it, or land cover data. And again, that's controlling where the dirt areas and grass and trees should, should be placed. Uh, and I'll just come in close to the ground level here. And you can see uh, just how detailed this is. Again, kind of harping on the point that the, uh, the vegetation base globe uh, biome system is, is uh, richly detailed and uh, saves us a lot of time when we're building terrain. Uh, and it's, it's also worth pointing out that in the next step, we're going to show imagery, but we don't even have to bring in imagery. I mean, this type of terrain can be good enough already for training. Um, we'll talk about buildings and the other features next, um, but imagery is actually optional. So you can bring in high-res imagery if you have it. It makes sense to use it a lot of the time, uh, but you don't have to. So here that's coming in now. This is our 50 centimeter imagery. Uh, and you can see, obviously, there's certain details that start to show that can be important, like the airfield surface uh, and other kinds of uh, recognizable uh, features in the terrain. And we'll just come back down to ground level again and compare that to uh, the purely procedural approach before. OK. So now the next step we're going to take is we're going to bring in the same type of layers again, but this is going to be lower resolution data, and it's going to fill in our area of interest. So this is our high detail area of focus, uh, but there's still a larger area of 30 by 30 kilometers that we want to fill in, so it kind of completes our, our play box. And that's what I'll do now is bring in the surface map for that larger area. This is lower resolution data that was produced much faster. Uh, and you can see it sort of meshes right in with that irregular shape of our uh, high detail area. You can see there's sort of a salt marsh and the different kinds of land features become much more clear this way. And finally, same thing with imagery. So 10 meter resolution imagery, uh, it blends right into the high resolution imagery and uh, works perfectly fine when, when viewed at a distance. Okay, so now we're gonna come in and take a look at this, um, this built up area here, which is the, uh, the housing section of the natural gas development. And you can see it has a very different style from the town we looked at previously. This is all brand new construction. It's all the same materials. And so we've actually put in sort of a geo, geographically based rule set in TerraTools that expects this data to be uh, using the same kind of uh, uh, building generation rules. So we've set everything to use red rooftops and then even made a few exceptions for the green rooftops. Um, but this was still automatically generated uh, according to what we saw previously. So now we have a really accurate representation of this area, uh, sort of building for building. Um, and it was generated just about on the fly uh, within hours. So you could imagine getting imagery from you know, yesterday and running that imagery through a process like this to get you know, very accurate representations of what is actually on the ground there. This is, I think, two or three months old, this current imagery. Um, and now, because we actually have this airfield feature, we're going to take a look at that. So we'll come in close and look at the 50 centimeter imagery. Uh, and you can see it looks great from the air uh, at, at altitude. But as you get in, it doesn't really hold up if you're doing uh, you know, ground-based or kind of flight operations off of this airfield. 
So we have a new technology or a new capability in, in TerraTools to uh, generate airports procedurally. So you'll, I'm going to bring that in now, and you'll see the few different layers load in. <clears throat> and it was done relatively quickly in less than an hour to generate this. Uh, I didn't have to trace out every shape. We're, we're generating, generating most of that automatically. Um, we just kind of assign a few, a few details to a, a linear feature and then let TerraTools generate the detail for us. Uh, and you can see here it, it holds up pretty well if you get right down at ground level. And again, of course, that's optional. It's, uh, you, you may prefer to have the imagery there in certain cases where you're not necessarily using the, um, the airfield at ground level. All right, so now we're going to come back into the town and just take another look over here. Um, one of the things that we did here, just it's kind of a relatively quick uh, process, but the I talked about the procedural um, uh, utility poles, just kind of a common thing to do. We don't have that in the geo data. We've just assumed that near roads and uh, uh, settlements, there's going to be a certain number of these. And for every so many of them, we've assigned uh, it to be a, a light source. You can see the, uh, the light bulb on the pole there. And as we change the time, just to show this again, I know Pete showed a little bit of this already, but we can change it to nighttime. And we'll just let the, there's actually an eye adaptation kind of feature happening here where the, uh, so as if our eyes are adapting to the, the quick change in light. We'll just let it change over the next few seconds here. And you can see um, the light posts, or a certain number of the utility poles have lights on them and are casting light on the ground. Um, and we'll just move the camera here in a second. And you can see uh, the town is kind of lit up now. So this is just kind of a really quick uh, example of what we can do now with lighting in VBS4, which is looks really, really nice compared to uh, how VBS3 wasn't bad, but um, I think we've made some pretty big improvements here. And we'll just switch things back now. Back to daytime. And yeah, so I mean, this terrain is now you know completely ready for simulation. So the roads, AI can follow the roads. They can move between the buildings. Uh, we talked about the biome vegetation. That's you can fully interact with that. You can destroy those trees. AI can navigate around them. And uh, so just really quickly here, we're just going to do a kind of a quick tour of the, the terrain at sunset here to show the show off some of the air, airfield details and and some other things. Yeah, th thanks, Will. It, it's a fantastic demonstration. And so just to confirm, like first off. There was no hand editing of anything. Is that correct? You were all kind of doing this in, in a separate tool set, right? Yeah, that's right. So so there was a configuration step to get the TerraTools project to understand the type of data that would be coming from LexCarta. But now that that's set up, I could give that to you and you could use this without any hand editing. You could just hit your browser, choose an area to be built, and you would get something you know similar to what I have here. Right. And, and, and it sounded like you were talking about hours, not days, in terms of timeline. I mean, it really, it just depends on the size of the data. Obviously, you need to do some processing. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. So this the terrain that we're looking at here was a matter of hours of, yeah, of processing time once, uh, once I hit go on the web browser. Right. Yeah. So we're, we're about to start answering questions. But I, I mean, I just want to finish up and just say two things Earl, while that kind of runs in the background. So the first thing is that um, we are building uh, a product around the world server that we'll be announcing later in the year, um, probably. Uh, so yes, you have the world server that gets shipped with VBS uh, 4 and VBS Blue IG, but it's part of a larger framework uh, for doing more enterprise terrain management. And that's what you're going um, to, to see us uh, talking a lot more about later in the year. Um, I don't want to spoil too much now, but uh, it's really exciting the kind of capability we're going to be offering uh, and not just specific to the VBS engine, right? So I, I want to make that really clear. One of the reasons we kept TerraSim separate is so they could work with multiple engines. Um, they're quite agnostic in their approach. Uh, okay, so um, that's the end of today's presentation. I'm about to start answering questions. Um, we have a, a, another session tomorrow where we will be uh, looking at 21.1. Earl will be back uh, doing some VBS geo editing and making that terrain come alive. Uh, and I'll be going through some of the key features in 21.1 at tomorrow's session. So please do come back. So I'm not going to be offended if you drop off now, but I do intend to start to um, walk through some of these questions. I mean, Ollie, if you're still out there, Maybe you could promote them for us, please. Uh, the altitude of cloud layer specified by users, yes. Um, you know, clouds are extremely uh, configurable and we'll also support multiple cloud layers and multiple types of clouds. 
um, really trying to meet, meet uh, kind of accreditation standards for flight simulation. Right, so what happens with terrains developed and improved in VBS3? I mean, you want to answer this one, Earl? Sure, yeah, so we have an automatic tool that's part of the world server, actually, that does um, translation from VBS3 to VBS4. Uh, it's not 100% translation, but you'll get, uh, basically, you get to continue your investment from, you don't lose your terrain. So there are compromises to make between what a VBS3 terrain is and what is in a VBS4 terrain. Um, but for the most part, you press the button and you get a terrain from VBS3 right into VBS4. Yeah, uh, maybe this is a territorial question. Go for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so is, uh, is it possible to use a terrain that I've made through uh, VBS to other renderers like Mach and uh, Vega Prime? So um, using TerraTools, yes, that's kind of the, the main purpose of TerraTools is to build terrain once and use that in multiple exports. Um, uh, we've done some experiments. We know with Mach, they uh, prefer right now OpenFlight as an interchange format. We export OpenFlight, and I'm sure it's the same with, uh, with Vega Prime. OK, so we're switching to VBS4. Is the inventory for characters modular and does load bearing impact fatigue? Uh, yes, so there is a weight simulation. Everything has a weight, and that will impact soldier fatigue, which impacts accuracy and also the, the sound of breath. Um, so yes, there is a, a simulation there. It can be turned on or off. It may be turned off by default uh, in the simulation settings. Uh, we're actually, right now, the universal component system is specific to weapons, so you can change and configure weapons, um, but it already extends in the simulation to equipment. So you can put on a backpack, take off a backpack, change soldier caps. We are working on a new UI for changing equipment at runtime. Logistics management, cargo move from one vehicle to another. Um, so yes, um, in fact, Ollie, I might even need you to answer. I don't know if you want to join. But I understand that you can use the forklift to kind of pick up a container and put it on a truck. The truck can drive. The container can get taken off and put onto another truck. Um, everybody, this is Ollie, who's hopefully wearing clothes. Look at that. Yeah. <laughs> you want to answer the question? Uh, yeah, so we do support full logistics, simulation and management and AAR recording. So things like the amount of fuel used, the amount of ammunition used by each individual asset is tracked during your, your mission. Uh, and we can simulate things like lo lo logistics transfer, so resupply of fuel and ammo to individual vehicles at runtime uh, during your training. Okay. okay, Ollie, you can promote and answer questions. <laughs> Okay, I'll try and do two things at once. No, no, shoot, um, shoot, shoot me another one. All right, so, um, uh, yes. At the moment, there is no plan to make VBS available for personal use, and uh, it remains a tool focused on military training. Uh, so uh, when it comes to eligibility, elig eligibility requirements to buy it, um, we do generally like to know how our software is being used and where it's going to be used. Uh, we're always happy to have a conversation. So if you'd like to learn more or ask us uh, if you can use it in a specific use case, please don't hesitate to reach out. Over to you, Earl. Uh, yep. So uh, actually, tomorrow we don't get uh, deeply into detail on this. But uh, yeah, you can certainly add sidewalks, traffic lights, traffic signs. Um, I think we have some example terrains of that. I don't know if they're actually in the uh, release or anything. But um, I guess the answer is yes, you can. Uh, you can develop those features. You can add those features to VBS4. Yeah, so I think I'll take this one. And, and uh, I mean, within a VBS4 context, so VBS4 has an offline mode that we'll be talking about tomorrow. And you can manually copy terrain data to offline VBS4 instances. So the world server is very much optional. We do recommend it because then you can do the kind of cool things that Earl was just demonstrating. And tomorrow, you're kind of, I'm going to do a bit of a deep dive into the world server. It's not that exciting, but it's important to understand, uh, especially if you're upgrading from VBS3 to VBS4. So the short answer is yes. Next question. Uh, over to you, Earl. Um, 
Well, actually, so there's a couple things here. One is uh, the data generation itself will be slower, so it'll take more time to generate this data. Um, but what we were showing was the ability to have this happen on a server. So if we were to move it into the cloud, for example, we could have different tiles of imagery being produced in the, simultaneously side by side. So there's a lot of opportunities to accelerate this type of work. Um, in terms of coming in at the same speed, so there's two things I showed. One is the generation, and then the other one was the live loading. So the live loading will come in at the same speed. I could bring in a 10 gigabyte uh, image, and because we're just loading the area that we care about when the when the uh, viewer is kind of looking at a at an area, that area will load just as quickly if it's a very large uh, data source or a small data source. Hopefully that makes sense. Right. So yeah, this is a really interesting question. So so we 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 do have because the question is really broad, right? So when it comes to mission planning data, we, we do have an MSDL plugin for VBS plan where we can bring in a plan from MSDL. Well, it's really the start state of a plan from MSDL into VBS plan. So uh, it's not included in the baseline because what we're finding is that each MSDL, um, each C2 system exports a different flavor of MSDL and we haven't really standardized uh, that just yet. So you need to talk to us if you want to talk about VBS plan ingesting MCIS data. Um, and when it comes to terrain, I mean, do you want to tackle that, Earl, like WMS maybe and that, that type of thing? Uh, sure, yeah. So I think, um, yeah, so that, that's where we have the kind of the separation between the VBS world server and its role in just streaming to VBS4 and VBS Blue IG. And then what I'm showing, which is we do have a lot more technology that we're working on that's in uh, different states of, of uh, completion. and being able to stream that terrain data to other systems is certainly a possibility. Where it actually ends up, whether it's part of a core, you know, VBS4 release or some sort of add-on, I think is a, is a question that hasn't been completely answered yet. Yeah, that's what we're working on now. And we're wrapping that up and we plan to announce before the, before 8 sec. Um, you know, in the demonstrations we've done to various customers, you know, we've connected C2 systems to the world server and pulled down map data through um, like a WMS stream. Um, so we certainly have all the bits and pieces, uh, but that's custom beyond what you would get with, with VBS4 out of the box. Yeah, so the VBS4 bundle is going to be announced later this year uh, officially. At the moment, the bundle includes uh, VBS Radio Pro. It will in include the close air support module that I showed you, uh, and it will also include the support from Microsoft Bing data. Um, that I'm going into detail on tomorrow. So at the moment, those are the three big items. Uh, Oli, was there anything else? So for anyone who has used the pro version of Chalkboard, some of the features from Chalkboard Pro, such as overlay sharing, will also be included, but they are now in the plan feature rather than the separate uh, Chalkboard application. Roger. And it's the same model as the VBS3 bundle. It's effectively a uh, like a small surcharge on top of the VBS4 base price to get access to the bundle. Yeah, well, I mean, I guess it depends on your definition of constructive. So, so VBS4 in its current form is a tactical constructive simulation. You know, so we're not doing, uh, like I mentioned, we do 2000 entities, which is sort of a battalion versus you know, small brigade type constructive event. Um, and because we're doing physical simulation, the time acceleration that's currently possible is limited to eight to 16 times. Uh, and a brigade level maneuver takes days. So you can you can do the math. So, so we're really still focused on that technical, uh, sorry, technical tactical um, combat. Now within that, there are some logistics capabilities. Um, there is resupply vehicles that can be uh, driven by artificial intelligence, there's kind of parachute drops. And you know, if an AI unit runs out of ammo, it will run to an ammo crate and re reload its ammunition. So yes, there are, it's, it's tactical logistics modeling. Um, as we scale up VBS, you know, it's going to certainly, uh, the possibilities will extend. Um, and yeah, we'll be talking about that more in the coming months to years. Uh, how accurate is the rendering? Oli, do you want to yep, talk so we, I can actually answer this one. So um, VBS4 has actually been used with a, uh, a live AI, AI system. So an AI system being used has been trained on real world uh, data. So the specific model was training very simple behavior for vehicle navigation in a town, um, trained entirely on real world data. 
that same AI was imported into VBS4, so given the VBS4 camera inputs and simulated sensor inputs, and was able to navigate as it was in the real world. So it's a really interesting area which um, we are seeing more requests for to validate AI behaviors that exist in the real world in a virtual environment and vice versa to train AI in the virtual environment for situations they may encounter in the real world. Um, the accuracy of rendering, it's a good question. Um, the rendering is as accurate as the models that go into it. Um, so if you want a very specific vehicle to be identified, if the model is accurate, as most of our models are, they are accurate within centimeters of the real thing. Um, it depends on the accuracy of your AI model to determine whether it identifies that vehicle or not, if that makes sense. Um, so it's really you know rubbish in, rubbish out, good quality data in, good quality results out. Yeah, and I guess you know we have ingested lidar data, ultra high resolution three D data, and the engine supports that. You know, we've, it's very different to VBS three where there were limitations into the in, in the complexity of the data that the engine renders. Uh, was that the last question, Ollie? Yep, that's it. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, we we are continuing tomorrow with a deep dive into VBS four twenty one point one. So thanks for your attendance. Thank you, Earl. Thank you, Ollie, and everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.